The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is good. We'll read about some of his goodness. If you have your Bibles, we'll open up to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous, so as to forget your work and labour of love, which you have showed towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. It's a wonderful verse. God is not unrighteous. If he was, he could forget. But he's not unrighteous. God is not unrighteous. And because he's not unrighteous, he's not able to forget the good that you do. That's why he's good. It's not possible for God to forget one good thing that you have done and not one labour of love that you've given since you've been a Christian that you've showed towards his name. Of course, his name is Christ. His name is Christ. So if you've done something, a a work, a labour of love on behalf of Christ to another person, God cannot forget it. Amen? Amen. Turn to the person next and say, God doesn't forget what you've done good. That's wonderful, isn't it? We forget. I think we're going to get a very big surprise when we arrive in the reward time in heaven and God hands out the rewards. I think the list that's read out about what we have done will think, when did I do that? When did I do that? I don't remember doing that. And God will say, well, you were human and your humanity is not righteous, so you forget, but I don't forget. I think that's wonderful to know that every good thing that you and I have ever done in the name of the Lord Jesus, Father God will never forget. Amen? Amen. But there's something else about God that Pastor Jim gave us this morning which backs up what I'm saying is God, because he's righteous, has taken every unrighteous thing we've ever done and nailed it to the cross and forgets it. God has this tremendous ability not to forget. But he also has an equal ability to forget. And Pastor Jim so clearly made that clear to us this morning in his communion message. Pastor Jim told us that everything that was ever written against us every unrighteousness in our life and within our inner person, Christ rubbed it out. He removed it. And so that's a beautiful thing about your God and my God. I feel sorry sometimes for religious people because they don't understand that. They go week after week after week after week and they say sorry for the same things they've been saying sorry for for years. And they feel guilty. And they feel like I'm no good to God. They feel like I I can't serve the Lord because of what I've done. Well, the good news this morning is because God is righteous, he never forgets your good things and he always forgets your bad. If you're his child and you belong to him, 
and you've given your life and heart to him and you're trusting in his son Jesus and believing in his son Jesus and you're doing good works and nice things in the name of his son, then God can never forget it. For if we can only grasp that, what sort of people would we be? Amen? Amen. Look to the person next to you and say, God never forgets every good thing you've done in the name of the Lord. God is so righteous. And this always indicates to me how righteous he is because some of my unrighteousness I couldn't forgive and I wouldn't have the ability to forget, but my God can. So his righteousness is so enormous, so high and deep and wide, that there's nothing can escape his forgiveness. If I'm working and living in the name of the Lord. If in all I do, I do in the name of the Lord. St Paul says, in all that you do, do it all in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Even at work, at school, wherever we find ourselves, we should be doing things in the name of the Lord. If we do them in the name of the Lord and there's any good in it, then God remembers it and records it. I think that's fantastic. He's a very righteous God. He remembers all our good and he's so righteous. Pastor Jim told us this morning, he dealt with all our unrighteousness. Through his son, he nailed them all to the cross. He took that list and, and as Jim said, he nailed it to the cross. It's hard for us to believe, isn't it? It's probably hard for you to believe. But this is just something we have to believe by faith. Our human mind can't conceive that a righteous God would take all our unrighteousness and nail it to a cross and put it under the blood of Jesus and forget it. What about these verses? As far as the east is from the west, God has removed all of our transgressions from us. And he remembers them no more. What a mind he's got. What a mind God's got. Sometimes I tell him, God, your mind blows my mind away. What a mind. As far as the east is from the west, God takes all those things that we've ever done wrong and he buries them beneath the deepest sea and he remembers them no more. You and I can't do that. We can remember what we did wrong as a little kid at school and at home. And as a teenager, and during married life and adult life, we can remember the things we've done wrong, but God has an ability to rub it out. Amen? Amen. I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm lost for words. And this is, this is, this is supernatural. In my Aussie language, this is super duper. This is unbelievable. No, it's not. By faith, it's believable. See, I've got to believe it by faith. I've just got to believe what the Word of God says. I've got to believe that God is so righteous that he forgets all my unrighteousness. I've got to believe what the Bible says. God is so righteous, he can't forget one good work I've done in the name of Jesus. <laughs> He doesn't count up all your bad and weigh it up against your good. He just counts up your bad and destroys it. So all he can look at is your good. Amen? Can you believe that? You need to believe it. 
Otherwise, you will never discover this God that we're supposed to serve and love. I can love this God because I know, as Pastor Jim said, that he loves me so much. He took every ordinance and everything that was written up against me and anything in the future that I've done will do wrong. All, he took it all and he destroyed it. Because he's righteous. We need to remember that our God is righteous God. A lot of religious people have got a God of religion, but he's not righteous. Righteous means he does everything right. And our God does everything right. He does nothing wrong. And we find that very hard to understand because we're human beings. And we do do wrong. And we are imperfect in our humanity and in our human thinking and flesh. We are imperfect. But our God is perfect. Amen? And because God is lightless, do you know what he did? We'll read some of it, what he did. And Paul says here, or the writer to Hebrews says here, we desire, verse 11, that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We're, we're hanging in for you, hoping that you will believe this. Because this is what God's done for you. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of a hope unto the end, that you not be sluggish, but imitators of them through faith and patience inherit the promises. I want to tell you this morning, there's people in this church and there's people around the world, they listen to the blessings preachers on television. And they wonder why God isn't releasing to them the great volumes of money that they want on this earth and things they want on this earth. But you know what? You have to please God before he will do that. And the way you please God is to believe him. To believe him. That you be not sluggish, but be imitators of them through faith and patience inherit the promises. See, it's through faith and patience we inherit those promises from God. All those promised blessings that we hear so much about on Christian television, they're available, there's no question about that. But they're inherited through our faith and patience and our belief in God. For when God, verse 13, when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no other greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promises. Of course, we're in the, in the last days. Give and get rich quick. That didn't happen to Abraham. I'm sorry, that did not happen to Abraham. I hear preacher after preacher after preacher on Christian television saying, give and you'll get it back right away. That is not true. I read the story of Abraham and he waited patiently. And he waited patiently. And he waited patiently. And he waited patiently to receive the promises. And it tells me this here. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promises of God. That's faith. God loves faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's faith that God blesses. Not your deals with him. I heard a preacher recently telling us how to make deals with God. You can't make deals with God. God's already made the deal in Jesus Christ. And all his promises, Paul says, are yes in Christ Jesus. They're yes and amen in Christ Jesus. 
God made all his promises in Christ. And if I have faith in Christ and I keep patiently holding my faith in Christ, I will receive the promises. Amen. For men verily swear by greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of strife. So if men have got a, a problem and they get together and they make a deal and they, they do some sort of oath and sign some contract or oath, they say, well, that's the end of the problem. But God willingly, more abundantly, to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, the unchangeable non-ability to change. Immutability. There is no way God can change his promise. It doesn't lay within his, his ability. It's immutable. God willing more abundantly to show under the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable, unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong encouragement who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth in through the veil. Who is our hope? Our high priest. Our high priest, Jesus Christ. Our high priest, Jesus Christ, has gone into God's temple where God dwells and he's walked beyond the veil and here's our hope. And God can't lie because of that. It's not possible because Jesus stands in front of him as a priest representing us. In the Old Testament, they had priests and they had a high priest. And he could only enter into the holy place and meet God once a year. And he had to do all sorts of sacrifices and cleansing every year. And they tied a rope around him that when he went through the veil, if he was struck dead, they could pull his dead body out of the presence of God. Because he may have done something wrong to offend God during that year. But our high priest, Jesus Christ, has done nothing wrong. There's no rope tied around him so the angels can pull him out from the holy place. He's gone into the holy place as our high priest and he represents us to God. And he stands there representing what he did on the cross that Pastor Jim spoke about and he presents that to God hourly and daily. He's our high priest. And because he's in God's presence, it's impossible for God to reject us if we're in Christ Jesus. It's impossible. It's not possible for God to reject us because Jesus is our high priest and he represents us in the holy place with God. Whether the forerunner, verse 20, is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our high priest. He had no beginning. He was with God in the beginning with God and he, he's with God forever. He's eternal. Oh, he had a human life that started and finished, but he's eternal and he's our eternal high priest priest and he stands every hour of the day and night ministering to God for us what a beautiful God yes. now the sake of time we'll just jump down a few verses through chapter 7 to whom verse 2 of chapter 7 to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. 
And we're talking here about Melchizedek, God's high priest, God's own personal priest. He was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither a beginning of days nor an end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. Abideth the priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of his incomes. This is how great Melchizedek was. But Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a forerunning picture of Jesus. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Let's go to verse 11. If therefore perfection were by Le the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made necessity of a change also of the law. Now what we're reading here is that the law ended, the law had to end, the priesthood, the Aaron priesthood had to end, the Levitical order had to end, so that this new priest of God could come on the scene. And praise the Lord Jesus is that new priest of God. He is our high priest. He is our high priest. And he is the new order of God. And he represents us in the kingdom of God. Verse 22, by so much was Jesus made surety a better covenant. See, a lot of people are still trying to hang on to the Abraham covenant. There's nothing wrong with them doing that, but it's not going to do too good for them. In heaven. In heaven. All the promises of Abraham for the earth. And we can hang on to those. That's up to us. But when we die, what will we have left? We can take none of those earthly promises and take them into heaven. It's not possible. There was a new priest who came into the scene. His name is Jesus Christ. And he made a better covenant a, a better testament, a better agreement. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. It, it's not possible for him to change either. And in the last days, church, we're trying to change him. I listen to preachers who are trying to change him. But you can't change this priest. You can't change this covenant that he's made with the Father. You can't do it. Oh, yes, you can. But you operate without him. And you operate in the world. And you gather the things of the world to yourself. But let me tell you, he's not your high priest. I promise you he's not. We haven't got the time this morning, but if you go through this book of Hebrews with me, I'll show you he's not. He came to establish a better covenant, a spiritual covenant, an eternal covenant, a heavenly covenant. 
eternal heavenly rewards. He didn't come to take up the promises of Abraham. He came to take up the unchangeable promises of his father. And in him lays every promise of God to his children. The promises are in Christ Jesus. And if we look anywhere else for the promises, I can tell you, we're looking sideways. We're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking away from the hope. Jesus Christ is the high priest of God and he is our eternal hope. And our hope is in him. Come and click on the donate button.